Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Councillors of Real Estate, it is a distinct, distinct privilege to welcome you to this special webinar event highlighting the CRE Consulting Corps and its recent partnership with the U.S. Navy and Naval Air Station Oceana in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Thank you for joining us. I'm Michelle Couillard, 2021 Global Chair of the Councillors of Real Estate and President and CEO of Buzak Real Estate and Equities in Montreal, Canada. Today's webinar represents the very essence of the compelling thought leadership and creative problem solving for which the counselors is known. We'll take you behind the scene as our consulting core team shares the challenges and recommendations associated with the redevelopment of, the, of a portion of a 5,331 acre base to benefit the uh, US Navy Marine Corps personnel, and the Virginia Beach community at large. I'd like to recognize the sponsors of today's event and all of the Councillors webinar series, the Altus Group, Equus Capital Partners, and Real Capital Analytics. Thank you, as always, for your support. While attendees will be muted during the courses of today's event, we're encour you're encouraged to use the Q&A feature should you wish to submit a question. Your participation is welcome and we'll answer as many questions as time allows. I'm uh, honored to introduce Jerry Turner Jr., CRE Principal of T4 Investment Solutions and T4 Housing Interest Management in Houston, Texas. Jerry was the team lead for the Consulting Corps Navy assignment and is the moderator in today's session. Welcome, Jerry. I'll let you introduce the members of our panel and the team. Jerry. Thank you, Michelle. Next slide. So many of you know uh, the, the CRE Consulting Corps, the Counselor's Public Service Initiative. Next slide. There are a number of uh, projects that we've done all over the country uh, and some international projects as well. Next slide. The, uh, the projects are grouped around economic development, uh, downtown revitalization, of course, international projects, uh, disaster response, affordable housing, universities and schools, faith-based organizations, and some odd uh, uh, consulting projects that have occurred with other groups as well. Uh, what's interesting about this particular project is it's the first project we've ever done for the Department of Defense. Um, and it's uh, very unusual. What I'd like to do right now is introduce uh, our special guest, uh, Brian Solis, to describe the city's relationship with our client, NAS Oceana. Brian? Sure, thank you, Jerry. And Samantha, if you would, on the next slide, if you feel free to cycle through the photos um, that basically show Virginia Beach and it's three, or at least two of the three economic drivers um, that we have for our city and the region of Hampton Roads, which is southeastern Virginia. And so uh, the military uh, in general has a $15.4, $15.5 billion impact. That was for fiscal year uh, 19. And for Virginia Beach, NES Oceana has, uh, represents the largest civilian employer, uh, and that includes Dam Neck with the special operations that occur there, the Dam Neck Annex um, for our city, uh, Virginia Beach, which is close to half a million people in the largest city um, in Virginia. And in, in 2005, Oceana was subject to a base realignment and closure uh, act that occurred. And we were able to stem that uh, from ultimately closing the uh, Navy's East Coast Master Jet Base at Oceana by uh, partnering with the Navy on um, incorporating zoning ordinance changes that um, ultimately and, and acquisition reduced the density of incompatible uses and encroachment around the in air installation. And with this next iteration of future base design that the, the group is going to talk about um, this afternoon, we're trying to get out ahead of any future BRAC um, opportunities that may, may come along. So thank you for having me. Next slide. So I guess with every project, there's always an ask. Uh, a client will ask uh, the consulting core if their situation would be something the consulting core can assist with. 
Casey Kemper is the one that happened to get the call and he made the initial site visit. Casey, what did you learn on your site visit? Okay, well, thanks a lot, Jerry. Um, I'll start a little history uh, of the project. We started back in 2019 when a member of Business Executives for National Security, a uh, nonprofit association who, which has ties to the US military, contacted our Chicago office. The Benz member had heard about the counselors and the consulting corps and also had a relationship with Admiral Rock, whose command includes Oceana. Okay, on this slide, uh, let's start here and say, uh, making a longer story short, after several conference calls uh, with the Admiral and his staff, I was invited to the base by the commander, Captain Hewitt, to visit the base, to tour it, to see where the consulting corps could help and to uh, connect with Captain Hewitt's vision for future base design. What you have here is a slide which outlines the uh, footprint of the base in Virginia Beach. You can see uh, if you had a larger scope here that it takes up um, quite a, a big footprint within uh, the city. And uh, marked on the uh, map here, you can see the yellow outline, um, which is uh, showing where uh, the captain uh, sees the future base design going. The white outline, the larger perimeter, is the current uh, outline to the base, um, which uh, the captain sees as containing a lot of surplus or non-essential, we'll call it, real estate. Um, so um, the uh, non-essential uh, base, uh, a part of the base uh, would be uh, cut back to the yellow setback that you can see on this map. And the setback then would uh, relieve the uh, base of non-essential facilities such as the bowling alley golf course and other things not mission critical. So the captain explained his vision of the base uh, comprised solely of mission critical real estate. And I explained the uh, consulting core capabilities and how we work. In a short while, we agreed that we could make um, a deal. We'd be a good match for one another. Next slide, please. Why future based design? Um, the Oceana facilities and infrastructure are clearly not serving the base mission as they should. The mission model calls for normalization of facilities, which includes sustainability, sustainment, uh, restoration, and modernization, all three objectives. Unfortunately, the current budget covers only 59% of the normalization requirement. There's only money for uh, sustainability, um, essentially operations, and no money for uh, restoration or modernization of an aging, deteriorating facility. Okay, please, the next slide. So here you see uh, a photograph of uh, Captain Hewitt here on the right, uh, the base commander meeting with uh, local leaders. Uh, so Captain Hewitt had uh, his vision uh, presented uh, to the local leaders, business and community leaders. Uh, and he had anticipated a good reception and some enthusiasm for his vision of the future base design. Unfortunately, that did not happen. And meanwhile, the funding gap was growing. So weighing his options, the captain decided to pursue the consulting core approach and um, to move the future base design forward with the aid of the consulting core. So the cons consulting core at this point entered the picture with an agreement um, with the Navy and thus an important project was born. So Jerry, I turn it back to you. Thank you. So with any consulting core project, you, you've got to have a statement of work that's executable. Next slide. And working back and forth with the Navy, we came up with five primary tasks. The first three are pretty straightforward, uh, but what really the Navy was hoping for out of the project were answers to tasks four and five. They needed to have some strategies that would ensure the quality of life for sailors and their families at a reasonable cost. And they needed a strategic plan that had actionable items, near-term and long-term items. You see an ad on there, uh, that came after we delivered um, our, our initial uh, report uh, on site. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Next slide. Right now, I'd like to introduce the team. Uh, when we put, sent out a request, uh, we had a lot of great talented folks that, that responded, but we had to down-select, unfortunately. Next slide. 
And the team started with Casey, of course. Casey was the first man on the site, did the initial site visit. Uh, I was asked to be the team lead. Um, and then uh, Bill, of course, uh, Norton and Skip Preble, Kirk King and Reed Wilson rounded out the rest of the team. Next slide. With, with every project that we do in the consulting corps, uh, when you land on the ground, one of the first steps uh, you, you need to do, next slide, is um, uh, set up interviews and meetings with uh, key stakeholders, uh, participants, and contributors. And, and the biggest stakeholder was the Navy. And the Navy had was in a rough situation, needed answers, and we needed to hear from everybody at the installation. The installation houses thousands of people, and uh, we spoke to every department head. Uh, the city, of course, uh, a key player in this process, local stakeholders, uh, state representatives, federal representatives, and market participants, those are the developers, uh, the real estate brokers, uh, and even the end users. Next slide. Uh, we conducted all of these interviews on site, on the installation, and, and that's us in the, uh, in the uh, officers club uh, conducting the interviews safely uh, distanced for COVID. Um, next slide. So it started with what the Navy was doing and uh, Bill uh, took the lead in looking at the parcels uh, that they were considering leasing out. Um, can you tell us about what the Navy wanted to lease, Bill? So uh, you've seen this before, there's the runways in the middle and uh, that deep core right in the middle is, um, was barracks and uh, housing and uh, administrative buildings. And a number of those functions were developed back in the 40s and 50s um, and are somewhat anachronistic. So today it's an open base, troops, many of the troops don't live there. They can't support a bowling alley and so forth. So that was part of it. But on around the edges on those blue parcels were what was deemed to be um, non-essential land uh, that the Navy hoped to actually lease out rather than sell. They sold it, the money went back to the treasury. It didn't do them much good. But the idea was to do ground leases on these properties that provided an annual revenue stream, which could be applied towards maintenance, repairs, facilities, infrastructures, and so forth. So the city of Virginia Beach is 350 square miles, 550 uh, square miles of water, 300 of land. Uh, we have just over 5,000 acres here you know, that we're looking at, and the facility had another 600 acres nearby, Jason Parcels. Um, we have looked at those parcels and drilled down to about 1,100 to 1,300 acres, uh, of which we thought was uh, constrained, as you see here, by uh, wetlands, environmental issues, local zoning, uh, APZ, Accident Protection Zone, and so forth. So that brought us down to about 400 acres. And then we looked at the specific uses that made the most sense, most of which are industrial. There's a further constraint that you couldn't put residential or other high density uses in these locations. This is the overall summary chart we put together, taking the locations, uh, the, the gross acres, and what was the net. And the key metric was that you can get about 10,000 billable feet per acre in that terrain down there. Um, so that translates into building area. And then we get a calculus on what the market value for these types of uses would be, which was one to two dollars a square foot of building per year. And we multiplied that out. And lastly, on the right, you see uh, a little metric we put together to figure out which parcels were easiest to develop or politically or physically or what have you, and uh, to give the Navy some indication of where they should uh, focus on their early efforts. Next slide. Skip. Did we lose Skip? Skip, I think you're muted. All right, thank you, how's that? Perfect. I wasn't able to make the visit because of COVID considerations here with my family. So I was asked to do a deep dive into the data considering and concerning the MWR activities and the related facilities. Next slide. 
This is NES Oceana in the 1950s. It was originally built in a very rural area about 70 years ago, surrounded by mostly agricultural uses without a lot of available uh, recreation or services. Uh, the MWR activities were developed on the base to provide these, meet these needs. Next slide, please. This is NAS Oceana today. As you can see, it's surrounded by uh, many different commercial and residential and recreational opportunities of all types. The MWRs are still there for the base, but there are alternative opportunities that have uh, sprung up in the last 50 years for recreation and services in particular. Next slide. What I did to come to some conclusions about what we could, what we needed to address was to analyze the activities for each of these core um, MWR activities. I actually uh, analyzed them as core versus non-core, one's core being required by the Navy to be on base. And then also we broke that out further by whether or not they were childcare related or not. And also we analyzed them in terms of the levels of patronage, the number of people who actually use the facilities that during the that year. Uh, we then considered revenue generated versus expenses incurred. Uh, also, whether or not there was additional funding available from the Navy to be able to take care of these the issues that were considered to be um, primarily uh, required for the activities on the base. Uh, generally speaking, red, bad, black, good. And as you can see, there's a lot of red in this, uh, particularly in the net revenue category before we have the subsidies. Those were the things we intended to uh, isolate on and address. Next slide, please. This is the bowling alley that's on the back. A pretty nice facility, it appears. I was not there, but I was told it appeared to be in good condition. Um, next slide. However, when you look at the accounting for it, you can see that this thing loses uh, 15 cents every game that's played. And unfortunately, this is on a cash basis accounting uh, that is uh, not accounting for long-term maintenance. It's not accounting for depreciation of the need for replacement of this project or this facilities later on. It's also not accounting for any kind of load from uh, the required for uh, you have paying salaries, uh, additional cost on top of the salaries, additional cost for just being on the base and maintaining the structures that provide access to it, very much like uh, property taxes do in a, in a given city. So this is a losing, a losing proposition before you even account for other expenses, which are actually pretty significant as a percentage. Uh, next slide. This is the, uh, an example of the officers, though this is an example of deferred maintenance. This is the officers club, which is a important part of the base. It, it allows them to, them to uh, be able to get together in, in a, a, a common professional facility, a common professional area. Uh, next slide. However, this is a Virginia creeper, I'm told, but it's growing up through the glass doors that you see over there on the far right-hand side, back where Jerry is making his presentation at the back. And this is one of the better facilities on the, on the uh, base. There is a substantial requirement for, this is a, both a repair issue and also a long-term maintenance issue. And we need to be able to uh, handle that as well. But I noted as I was going through all the accounting, uh, there was voluminous records here that I had to process. But unfortunately, the Navy's financial system does a really good job of tracking what's been spent, but it really doesn't do very well at tracking what things cost. Um, and that's, that's the issue that we're trying to account for here. Uh, next slide. And now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Kirk King, who's going to talk about the market there. Sure. Uh, first, one of the things that we did was look at the markets in uh, Virginia Beach and Hampton Roads. Uh, we looked at all the different property types uh, so we could understand the fundamentals of those markets and kind of the, the market demand uh, for each of those different property types. 
Then we overlaid the uh, constraints that Bill mentioned earlier, such as wetlands, um, the noise restrictions, uh, accident potential zones, there were legal restrictions where it couldn't be developed. And also looked at other things like the fact that it had the base has no master plan, no strategy, no real zoning um, and other typical requirements and that the commercial market looks at when they're uh, developing. Um, and so then we looked, looking at all that together, we looked for opportunities uh, for new development um, and noted there were a number in different parts of the uh, base. Um, but, and so for an example, uh, one place we noted was the central campus on the next slide. Um, the central campus is kind of the core of the base and has uh, currently has housing there, office space, uh, retail space, and the other recreational facilities uh, that Skip just discussed. And we saw that there was an opportunity to integrate commercial development and tenants into this central campus. Um, one such example is on the next slide. Um, this was a fairly obvious immediate term example in that there was condemned barracks there, where, but there was many sailors who couldn't live on base as the Navy wanted them to because these barracks were condemned and the Navy had $36 million in a military construction project to renovate those. And being only 132 rooms, uh, we quickly realized that that was $250,000 per room to renovate them, not including land or the existing structure, just renovations. And we explained to the Navy that, that you, know, you could develop three or four times the number of barracks for that same price. Um, on the next slide, then we showed them examples of in, in the current Hampton Roads, Virginia Beach market, uh, recent multifamily developments that had been developed there and the quality of those, plus you get the additional amenities of kitchens and living rooms, not just the rooms that are kind of in the barracks and kind of showed them kind of the art of the possible, what, was, what they could have, um, many more rooms to solve their housing shortage by engaging with the private sector developer. To, to bring this into the central campus. So that was one, just one such example. Um, so next I'll turn it over to Reed and he'll talk a little bit about legal and other public private partnership structures that were uh, critical in helping the Navy craft a path forward. Thanks Kurt, appreciate it. Let's go to the next slide. So the reason we were there is to, to bring our collective expertise as a CRE panel to determine what is possible what's practical. So a good bit of the analysis from a regulatory and legal perspective focused not just on the real estate, but on the structure and the processes. So from a legal perspective, we were looking at what are the mandates? There's mandates on the, on the Navy, uh, authority issues, how can things get accomplished? What is the the process, the line of, of authority, power, and what are the processes to deal with those? Then from a regulatory perspective, we were looking at local, state, and federal regulation on land. There were three levels we had to look at. One was the real estate piece, and you've already heard some about that. The properties that were available weren't really practically usable, at least not in the near term. In terms of structures, there had been some structures that had been in use by the Navy and by other groups of the armed forces to deal with excess land. We investigated those and we determined that those had not proven to be very effective. Then there's the private transaction process. We all know that from, from our deals. We know that in the private transaction process, it's not just the developer wanting to obtain the land, it's the developer having to deal with the issues and requirements of the equity investor, of the financial provider of capital, and with the needs of tenants. And over all of that, timing. Time is money. My clients tell me time kills deals, Reed. Get it, get it done quickly. And we looked around the country 
at other examples of interactions between the Navy and other services and the private sector to deal with excess land. And what we discovered is that that was not going to be an effective process for either party. Uh, the Navy's not in the real estate business. The Navy is in protecting our shores, protecting our people, the same with all the armed forces. The real estate division, uh, business and industry is entrepreneurial. They're capitalist. They are providing services and locations for industry, for people to live. Uh, they're providing a rate of return to their investors. They are paying interest on the loans. And this was not gonna work. We didn't think this was uh, a, a process that would be effective in the future. So we looked at some alternatives and what we felt was necessary is we needed to have an intermediary. We needed to have an intermediary between the Navy and the private sector. An intermediary who could deal effectively with each one understanding their needs and their goals. And it was critical that that intermediary uh, would have the respect of the Navy and the Navy would feel comfortable delegating uh, some authority to that party to do deals with the private sector. The private sector needs certainty of execution. It needs to know timing, it needs to know process, it needs to know that the party they're dealing with has the ability to understand uh, the private sector's needs and has authority and the ability to move forward and transact. And that's where we ended up with the city. The city had a vested interest in seeing that Oceana did well and through their economic development department they understood the needs of the private sector and they would be motivated to, to make deals. And that was what was critical is when we were able to get with the city, talk to Brian, uh, work with them to help uh, work with the issue of the intermediary status. When we rolled this, I, these ideas out, it was well received uh, by the Navy. The Navy felt confident and comfortable dealing with another governmental authority. Uh, the development uh, industry was comfortable working with the EDC of the city. And so that's where we came to some of our most important recommendations. I'll turn it back over to Jerry now. Thank you, Reed. <clears throat> so at the end of the, the week, the time that we spend on the ground with the Navy, we deliver um, an outbriefing, if you will, uh, and the outbriefing is focused on what we learned and what our initial impressions are. Next slide. And this was this, the culmination of our outbriefing. We had other support slides, but <clears throat> our recommendation, the Navy asked us point blank, is what we're trying to do have merit? Should we, should we keep doing this? And we said, absolutely, you should. Uh, and you should advance your, your program. Uh, we also tried to help them understand that um, to be successful, it's going to require a coalition, if you will, of participants. It's not just getting to the end user. Uh, it's making sure you get to them in the right way, as Reed described. Um, and a key uh, ally in this process was going to be the city of Virginia Beach. Um, we also encouraged them to, to explore creative solutions for MWR activities. Uh, and their barracks situation. Um, and our, our primary uh, initial view of the whole situation is that they needed a master tenant. They needed a way to work directly with someone that could help them out the most, specifically the city. And they needed to issue an, a request for proposal or an RFP that um, uh, required master planning support, tax exempt project and infrastructure financing, uh, installation support or city services on an installation and the uh, capacity and ability, not the requirement, but the ability to execute something called a city-based transaction. Next slide. Well, this is the celebration after the, uh, the briefing and a very long week with the team. 
Um, we were in the officers club and you'll notice uh, uh, the gentleman in uniform in the center is our primary client, Captain Hewitt. During our, our session, he approached us and asked, uh, would it be beneficial for the Navy to go to San Antonio and see firsthand uh, what Brooks City Base is all about? Next slide. Uh, we thought that it would. Um, and to, to give you a, a thumbnail example of what Brooks City Base was, it was a transfer, not sale, but transfer of title and lease back of an active military installation. Uh, so the Air Force transferred title and leased it back. What I'd like to do now is turn this over to Kirk King so he can take you through the Brooks story. Sure, thanks, Jerry. Um, yeah, as Jerry mentioned, the um, the Brooks City Base transaction was between uh, the Air Force where they transferred fee title of the 1,300 acres to the Brooks Development Authority, uh, Redevelopment Authority formed by the city of San Antonio. And then the Air Force leased back the facilities or the actual buildings that they needed on the installation um, on a 20 year lease uh, with four 20 year renewal options at zero rent for just expense reimbursements. Um, and as you can see here at 2001, this is what it looked like before the transact, before the transaction, there was, a, it was a medical research facility, although you see runways, they weren't in active use. It hadn't been at some time. Um, by hiring a Brooks Development Authority, hiring a, a property manager, uh, you know, commercial property manager, uh, they were able to maintain the facilities with the Air Force had done for about $36 million a year. Uh, they did that, were able to do that for the Air Force for about 18 million, so stating basically 50% for the Air Force was significant savings, which was part of the goal of the project. Um, but you see here in 2002, this is where, where the property actually transferred. Um, you can see some uh, up in the upper right corner, some grading going on that uh, even before the transaction, some of it's uh, started with a, uh, a, a commercial retail developer there. Um, on the next slide, you'll see this is a Brook City base today. Um, the significant development that has occurred since then, it's been 19 years, but up in the right corner was the retail development. Um, there's a Sam's and Walmart that went in there, that initial land sale, uh, the BDA was able to use that revenue to uh, develop or to build infrastructure. Because um, one of the first things that the BDA had to do was to hire land planners and civil engineers to understand the status of the infrastructure there and develop a master plan with that new infrastructure, the new roads, um, getting rid of the, the runways as well as the new utilities so that they could and, and develop a master plan with land uses so that they could um, engage with commercial developers and other tenants and users uh, to develop to redevelop uh, portions of the base that the Air Force uh, no longer needed. And you can see below the Sam's and Walmart, there's one of the three multifamily developments to the right of there, there's two hotels uh, to the left of that multifamily development was a uh, land sale to a hospital where the hospital was, has been built along with medical office facilities. Uh, just kind of the right and down from there is a build a suit that the Brooks Development Authority did for a pharmaceutical research and manufacturing company. Um, below that, you'll see other uh, uh, plastics manufacturing facility that was constructed, a food packaging facility that was constructed. Um, you'll see there's a speculative uh, distribution warehouse that's, uh, that has recently just finished construction. Uh, there's a charter school, um, more towards the center of the city built an emergency operations center there. Uh, there's also um, up at the upper left corner of it, the existing facilities that the Air Force uh, eventually vacated. They were all uh, now have become a local university school of, of medicine. And finally, at uh, and we went through all the pretty Brooks City based transaction with the Navy again at the tour and walking through a lot of the existing facilities and answered a bunch of questions and helped them better understand it. And at the end of the tour, we uh, came back to the, one of the ho new hotels that was built there at the conference center and had a workshop session there to help them uh, develop this further. And Jerry will explain more about that work session.
Thank you, Kirk. Uh, next slide. So we, we sat down and we talked about what we saw, but the most important thing that, that we felt we could, uh, we could offer the city and the Navy was to walk through their options. Uh, we listed five options. One, status quo, don't, don't do anything. Keep doing what you've been doing and hope for the best. Cantonment is where the military will compress down to its mission essential footprint. It kind of leaves your MWR activities stranded. Uh, base realignment and closure is very effective at reducing cost. It's also very effective at uh, destroying local economies. Uh, an EUL or ground lease, enhanced use lease, is what the Navy was considering. And it can be effective in generating revenue, but um, it doesn't generate a lot of revenue ground leases. Uh, city bases have been demonstrated as an option that can significantly reduce base ops cost or operating expenses. And on the left-hand side, you'll see all the considerations we listed. And this is uh, one of several sheets that we went through with the Navy and the city. So what I'd like to do now is reintroduce Brian Solis and, and ask him essentially to help us understand uh, what did you get out of the workshop and uh, what's next for the city and NES Oceana. Brian? Sure, thank you, Jerry, and, and everybody again for, for having me. And so um, I, I think the end result of the counselors of real estate's work is that uh, in a lot of ways, it, it comes in with a fresh set of eyes from subject matter experts uh, assembled from their respective disciplines. And um, as a city, we have uh, taken part in panels like that in the past, for example, with Urban Land Institute and certain nodes of the city and, and doing quick charrette type um, work. But that's primarily from a planning and design standpoint. And frankly, the CRE report um, really provided uh, tangible, useful recommendations for moving forward from a real estate standpoint, uh, real estate development standpoint, economic development standpoint, and um, even advice moving forward to address um, the Department of Navy's uh, Oceana installations um, operating uh, expense challenges and uh, addressing their operating funding shortfall uh, issues. So the if we can go to the next slide, the, the, the photo there is Captain Hewitt, CEO of, of NES Oceana, um, briefing our city council right before Thanksgiving. We wanted to be sure that we capitalized on the momentum from the San Antonio visit and, um, and CRE's, the, the, the traveling panel's um, work and, and definitely squeeze it in for the, uh, the holidays. And um, one of those COVID windows when we're able actually to, to do uh, limited briefings in person uh, with our council. And um, he's holding up the CRE report right there and was able to give them a firsthand account of the recommendations and the process that Jerry and the panel here just reviewed. We followed that up with um, some, some light reading over the uh, Thanksgiving holiday by putting that um, report in their Friday packages. Um, let it marinate for a bit through um, uh, New Year's and then when we were able to get uh, first opportunity on council's agenda, um, we actually um, put on there for them to consider a future-based design. Um, it's a non-binding agreement, but it, it solidifies the framework between um, our partners in the Navy at the installation level and um, the city of Virginia Beach uh, moving forward. And so, from that briefing on November 24th through the holidays until March and basically three and a half uh, to four months, we not only briefed our council, um, we got buy-in from them, um, head nods on the concept. We drafted a future-based design agreement, um, both with the policy sides of the house and the JAG legal sides of the house. And um, it was approved on um, March 16th and it's in the process of getting uh, signed by all parties right now. And what it does is generally sets uh, the framework for, for three main things. Um, the primary thing from the uh, priority really from the city standpoint is a master um, lease agreement with the 1200 or so underutilized uh, acres in and around NES Oceana 
uh, for the, the purposes of, of economic development. And it may be 1,200 acres, but the net, um, and we talked about the wetlands impact and other things, uh, the net may be 50 to 60% of that, but it's still uh, a significant uh, new portfolio of, of inventory um, to, um, to be able to market and, and ultimately develop. Uh, the second piece, which has been advanced um, already, has been the shared services piece. And we kind of look at it as uh, more of a cooperative procurement standpoint where um, we are looking through all of our different types of service related annual contracts and um, seeing where, where uh, what's the duration of those contracts? When is the first opportunity for maybe the Navy to be able to piggyback on some of those and, and add say lane mile, miles for um, traffic light repair, um, pothole repair, repaving to grounds maintenance. And also looking through Virginia procurement, the Virginia Procurement Act to see what tools are in our toolbox um, for that. And then the third piece um, that uh, Skip touched on was say for example, MWR services. How can our uh, military um, families um, and employees uh, stimulate, further stimulate our economy by um, getting those recreational leisure and um, gym memberships from the private sector that are in and around the base through uh, different types or new types of stipends that, that they may get so that they don't um, necessarily have to get them on the base and the base have to provide that service. So. Um, those are three main ways that we're moving forward um, into the future um, with with the work based on what CRA uh, provided CRE provided for us. That's that's um, all I, have. I think. The next slide is is maybe some recent press on that. So, thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Brian. Um, I, I think we're we're ready to entertain any questions, and I know that uh, you have the option to. Uh, submit questions through the Q&A portal. Um, I see uh, one question. How is a, a, a consulting core project selected? Um, that's a good one. Uh, Casey, why don't you take that one? Sure. Um, as a um, counselor who's been on four assignments and the current uh, liaison to uh, the leadership uh, get involved in uh, project selection. And, uh, you know, we do solicit uh, ideas, uh, leads, if you will, from our members. Uh, and we're hoping this webinar will uh, result in some of our uh, counselors thinking about what needs there are in their own community. So it comes up from uh, members. Sometimes a uh, lead uh, or an idea for a project will come from a chapter. And sometimes it will come from uh, the community. As I mentioned to you in the case of Oceana, the first uh, uh, contact we had was with someone who was just familiar with the counselors and CREs through a member. So it comes from a variety of sources. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's uh, always a case of someone thinking about uh, a problem that they haven't been able to solve and they need expertise like we provide. Thank you, Casey. We've got another question. What problems exist doing the Brooks City type of development in Virginia versus Texas due to political climates? Um, I'll, I'll take that one. Uh, Brooks uh, City Base was conceived and executed um, uh, between uh, base realignment and closure actions in the military. In other words, there really was not active pressure to do it. Um, on top of that, it was conceived and authority given during a, a Democratic, during the Clinton administration, and the execution was during the Bush administration. So I, I think um, it comes down to local support, quite honestly. Uh, does the, the Navy uh, want to do it? Um, and does the community want to do it? And if you've got two parties uh, that are that are willing and, and prepared to do it. You've got leadership, uh, which is a second key component um, that is prepared to advance the concept forward. And finally, um, uh, federal representation that's prepared to back it. Uh, there isn't any, any reason you can't do a city base anywhere else. 
Kirk, would you agree? Yes, I would definitely agree. I think that would be uh, the, anytime the climate's favorable, as long as both parties want to do it. And probably it's on the political side, obviously has a little bit more, uh, a little more, more of a challenge for the Navy to have a few more layers of bureaucracy to get through, but it can be done in any climate. So we've got another question. Uh, what kind of follow-up uh, is engaged to investigate whether recommendations are applied? Um, fortunately, on, on this project, uh, we, could, we could see firsthand because it was public knowledge. It was in the press and, and uh, uh, set in a public forum when Captain Hewitt uh, announced the intentions of the Navy to work with the city uh, in front of city council. Um, but I, I can't speak for all projects. Uh, uh, would you like to, to handle that one, Casey? Uh, could you repeat the question? I want to make sure I, I got it. The question is, uh, what kind of follow-up uh, yeah. engaged to investigate whether our recommendations are applied or not? Good. I'm going to answer that. Also, why, uh, as a part of the answer to the first question, I was asking how projects selected. I do want to give credit to our consulting GORE committee. Uh, Brent Palmer, who's the chair of that committee. Uh, when we do source uh, potential projects, they're referred to the committee and um, our very capable Chicago staff, including Samantha DeCoven, uh, get involved in vetting the merits of a project. So I do wanna make sure that we understand uh, that the, the committee itself plays an important role. Um, as far as follow-up is concerned, uh, you know, that varies by project. Sometimes it seems like the case is closed when we leave uh, and finish the assignment, hand over the report. Sometimes it feels like uh, there's another chapter to be written and it depends largely on what the client uh, asks of us. If they want follow-up, we're happy to give it. Uh, we never impose um, a process on them post assignment, but uh, we stand ready to help those who ask. Thank you. There's another question. Uh, are there opportunities remaining for private developers at NES Oceana? Uh, I think the answer is absolutely. Um, I think it's just opening up. What are, you, what are your thoughts, Bill? Well, as we described, um, the city to its economic development vision is going to essentially have a master lease and look at those parcels and look at uses and help facilitate uh, the coordination of city zoning and infrastructures, traffic, and all those things with uh, the parcels and sort of take the Navy bureaucracy out of the way. And we, in our 50 plus interviews, met a number of developers who had interest, um, as well as contractors and service people. So um, it's making the parcel sort of uh, doing the diligence to figure out what's there and what can be built there and putting that knowledge on the street and then marketing them according to what can actually be achieved. Okay, and we have another question. What criteria was used for selecting the, the CREs that, that participated? Um, I, I think it really came down to uh, two elements. We wanted to make sure that the folks on the team had experience with uh, working with the military in the past uh, or on military installations in the past. Um, and we needed somebody that really had uh, firsthand knowledge of public-private partnerships. Um, and, and, and don't get me wrong, we, we've got incredibly talented people in our membership and it was uh, not easy to make a selection. The good news is it's, it's refreshing to see that we have so much bench strength. And when the next time we get a project with the Navy or another client, uh, we know we'll get some very capable people. Um, let's see. Uh, Jerry, I, I have a, I have a question here that popped up and, uh, it says I have spent, I have spent time in Norfolk and, and Virginia beach area and the jet noise around the base is almost paralyzing during takeoffs and landings. How did you incorporate the APZ zone, the accident potential zone issues? That's an excellent question. Um, the, the APZ uh, certainly limited the types of land uses. So residential uh, was not a, a, an acceptable land use inside the APZ. Um, 
uh, high business activity, retail, uh, uh, labor intensive manufacturing, any land use that was gonna require a concentration of people for an extended period of time created a problem. Bill, have you got any other thoughts about that? No, that's right. I mean, we had a manufacturer um, who wanted to put 600 people and it was under the APZ and they, uh, the calculus came back, the Navy said, no, there can't be more than 152 people in that building. So right. it, it de-densifies down to kind of warehouse distribution levels. It's not yeah. high-end manufacturing. Hmm. And also the, uh, the city zoning ordinance that was the changes that happened in 2005 from, from the BRAC already kind of layers in the APZ ones, APZ twos, and, and the other high noise zones by use that, that Bill and Jerry just um, talked about. So we already know what type of, um, you know, uh, different products that we'll be pursuing and, and different uh, types of them, employers and uh, land uses already, but um, it's acknowledged that it's an issue, um, but it's already embedded in our zoning ordinance on, on what we can consider. And citizens of the city, that is not high noise, that is the sound of freedom. That's true. <laughs> and it becomes ubiquitous after a while. We sat out one night having meeting with some people and after the 38th jet flew right over our head, you hardly noticed it. <laughs> it only took 38. Well, Brian, since, uh, since you're, you know, one of the things that we noticed, I guess, was the relationship between the city and, and the Navy was, was already very, very strong. Uh, it was kind of the, the benefit of, of the experience you went through uh, when the base was on the BRAC list in 2005. One of the things that we noticed, though, is the, the city was, was prepared to do anything that the Navy requested but the Navy didn't quite know what to ask. So it seemed like the city was somewhat reactive rather than proactive. Has this changed the paradigm for the city? I think it uh, further evolves it um, for sure. Um, I think, you know, the last 15 years with the Commonwealth of Virginia and, and the city, we had been funding uh, seven and a half million dollars worth of acquisitions a year um, each, so $15 million a year, uh, to reduce encroachment and density. And um, we accomplished that goal of re reducing incompatible uses around Oceana. So what this does, uh, you know, over whatever that ends up being, 140 some odd million dollars worth of real estate acquired, um, and, and in some cases repurposed, but um, what it does now is evolves it to, okay, well, um, with the base tightening up its, its gate and gates and its fenced area, how can we go to the next level of um, providing services to each other and um, having a mutually beneficial relationship? And so that's economic development and additional um, sites on our on our end and it is getting economies of scale and service delivery on the on the military side. Okay. Well we've got another question here. Uh, with respect to the Navy, what can the counselors expect the next steps to be? Um, interesting that we we had a, a recent uh, uh, Zoom call with uh, the Admiral uh, that Captain Hewitt works for. Um, Michelle, you were on that call why don't you answer that question? Well, it was actually we had uh, we had an initial call with uh, with Captain Hewitt, and then this call um, with Admiral Rock, and uh, the intent was to uh, seek the advice of the admiral to see how uh, and and how much more assignment opportunities could be available for the counselors and for the Corps. And uh, it turns out that there might be two new assignment, two new uh, base and, 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 and excess land situations, a little different, but I guess in, in a way similar to, uh, to uh, uh, this assignment uh, that uh, we, uh, we hope to be able to, uh, to advance further and, and uh, to be retained uh, to, uh, to assist the, uh, the Navy and the armed forces um, into that work. 
So it's it's basically um, an, a great endorsement to uh, the consulting core, to Jerry's team and, and Jerry's work and in the entire consulting core's work and the counselors. Uh, and I, th I think, you know, we joke with this, but Jerry and the team has set the bar quite high with the... Uh, with the amazing report uh, that was produced, and uh, but we hope to be able to uh, to get to new uh, new, new assignments with uh, DoD and and the Navy in the future. Okay, um, we've got another question. A uh, couple of questions. Will the report be available uh, for review? And right now, it's public record because it's it's been uh, uh, passed out to City Council. So I, I can't imagine there's a reason it, it wouldn't be. Um, uh, the follow-up question to that would be, uh, how is uh, the Navy, how does the Navy decide what to sell or lease land for in various developments? Um, what's interesting about the Navy uh, is that, and the DOD, is they can't operate like the private sector. Um, they have to have A, the authority, and be the permission to transfer title or uh, enter into um, a, a lease fee arrangement uh, with the private sector. So uh, while you might think that would be a day-to-day -day portfolio decision for the Navy, uh, whatever they, they think would be a good idea today often takes years, if not decades, to actually execute. Um, so in, and in many cases, uh, one commander may come up with the idea, it gets some traction, he gets promoted and move, moves on, and it's two or three other commanders behind him that actually has to have to execute it. And it's almost like telling, whispering a story into someone's ear and seeing how it comes back to you. Um, that creates a, an interesting dynamic when you're dealing with uh, the federal government and specifically the DOD. Um, do we have time for one more question? I think we do. Uh, this is a good one. Uh, is there a need uh, for the consulting core when nonprofits and governments can hire the help they need already? Uh, and, and that's an interesting question. Um, I'll try and tackle that one. Uh, what the consulting core adds is uh, the ability to be completely unbiased. Uh, I will say that, that a lot of people, and I am a recovering former federal consultant, uh, look to projects with their client to gain more projects with their client. Whereas the consulting core comes in uh, from the outside, we assemble a team that are not from the area. We come in and, and answer the question and leave because we've got other jobs and other businesses. We can be completely unbiased. Um, and I think especially in this example, in this particular case, uh, that added an immense amount of value. Uh, and help set the tone for the client, I believe. And that's why I'm a believer in the consulting core. Uh, with that, I'm, I'm happy to turn it back over to you, Michelle. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, great question, great answer to finish. Um, that's a great presentation for uh, Jerry and the team and, and, and Brian. Uh, we really appreciate your presence here. Um, so thank you all for sharing this uh, unique real estate story. Uh, that's what it is. It's really a real estate and unique real estate story. And a very special and warm thank you to the U.S. Navy and the city of Virginia Beach, Brian, and the consulting core leadership, Brent Palmer, chair of the consulting core, and Casey Camper, uh, counselors, liaison vice chair for 2021. And Casey, as you, as you heard, was... Uh, also an important, crucial part of this uh, initiating this dialogue with the Navy. The assignment uh, is one of the most significant projects the Consulting Corps has undertaken in its 20 year history. Uh, many of our new CRE members have expressed an interest in the counselors in the Consulting Corps. And we're uh, delighted you've joined us today uh, to better familiarize uh, yourself with the Counselor's Signature Public Service Initiative. We hope you'll uh, get involved by contacting our staff with projects in your community that could benefit from the consulting core assistance and volunteering when we announce projects opportunities in the future. On-demand recordings uh, are available for most of the counselors' webinars, including today. 
I encourage everyone to visit the CRE.org slash webinars for information on other topical and thought provoking programs in development, including uh, corporate boards, how to get there on April 21st. And this again will be for our members only, as well as uh, a special presentation in partnership with the American Hotels and Lodging Association on the future of hospitality, one of our one of the sectors and asset class that's being hit the hardest. And that's on May 20th. Until then, on behalf of the counselors of real estate, thank you for attending.